Hello, this is the Stories Beside channel. I release videos every day for you. Subscribe and click the bell. Austin. Norman has been married to young Iris for a little over five years. The young girl's affair with the middle-aged man did not last long. Austin got used to married life. When his wife filed for divorce and asked to vacate their common house, it was as if the whole world turned upside down for him. Austin could not imagine his life without his family and children. He has to come to terms with the new reality. He also loves his son Eric very much. A couple years after the divorce, Austin was able to buy himself a house in an old village. After buying the house, the first thing he did was take his son Eric to live with him. Eric was very happy to live with his father. They had a lot in common. They communicate like best friends. After some more time, Norman told his son that he was tired of loneliness and wanted to get married. The acquaintance with his new fling took place in a restaurant. Eric hoped to see a woman about his father's age. But a bright young woman came to meet him. She seemed to be the same age as Eric or older by only a couple of years. She was also very pretty. At first glance, Iris seemed like a quiet, calm girl. But it wasn't until a few months later that it became clear to Eric that she wasn't so simple. There is definitely some kind of power in her that conquers people even with a silent look. Eric did not like it, because it was these properties Iris began to interfere with the relationship between father and son. The father began to devote little time to his son. And after all, he now has such a crucial moment in his life. He studies well at the university began to develop his business in parallel. He really needs a good companion, and the father spends all his free time with his young wife. One day there was an event that made Norman reconsider his attitude to his son and to his young wife. Norman had his own brokerage firm, with an office located in the central part of the city. It was only an hour's drive from the township of Istok. After lunch, Norman felt that he didn't feel like working at all. So he decided to come home early, and he was not expected home at that moment. Change his shoes in the hallway. Norman heard Iris and Eric talking. Eric, have you thought about the baby? He's gonna want to know the truth later. And anyway, I don't think it's fair, Boris said. Don't worry, I'll think of something. The main thing is that nobody knows about it yet. By the way, how are things going with that issue? Any progress? Eric asked. I'm watching, everything is going according to plan. No one's really trying to take your place, said Iris. At that moment, Norman came into the kitchen. Iris was happy to see her husband early and kissed him and invited him to the table. Eric was less friendly. He wished his father and stepmother a pleasant evening and left. Norman did not directly ask his wife the gist of the conversation. He decided to handle the matter professionally. A couple of weeks later, a private detective sat in Norman's office and laid out the photos in front of him. Mr. Norman, we've been able to find out something. It is true that your son and your wife occasionally meet on neutral territory, but we can't yet say what they talk about or what their goals are. We need more time, said the detective. Well, then keep watching. I expect details as soon as possible, Norman said. The village of Istok is located at the foot of the mountain. It doesn't have many residents, but it has its own atmosphere. There is a good tradition of planting perennial trees wherever possible. Thanks to this tradition, it is always beautiful here. The roads are paved with natural stone. Frequent rains wash away all the dust, car wheels so polish, and these stones that they sparkle at any time of the day. Along the narrow village roads, wardens are set up in treacherous metal and painted in a single calm color. Residents make sure that the pupil's lamps are always clean and working properly. At every turn, along the narrow central road, gazebos made of OREWOD wood have been installed. True, rarely anyone sits there. The people of Stoke are mostly homebodies. They rarely gather outside and do not disturb each other without a reason. Houses are spaced far enough apart. For lack of enemies and criminals, the fence here is decorative in nature. The gates are never locked. In the summer, Stoke constantly blows a light breeze, 
and in the evenings you can hear the flow of the mountain river, to which you can walk for five minutes. Along the river, there are green lawns everywhere, on which young people like to hold fun parties at night, and the villagers dislike these visiting parties the most. They disturb their sleep. At the entrance to the village there is an old chapel, the history of which goes back to the Middle Ages. The chapel has been guarded by a lonely old man all his life, if he died recently, and now his faithful four-legged friend, Box, roams around the chapel. But there is no one to watch over the chapel. The villagers have met several times and agreed to take turns guarding the chapel, but no one honors the agreement, and the need to honor the tradition is urgent. It is not even discussed. This is the only pressing problem of this village. There's a second problem for the village, and that's the car ball and Norman's son Eric. Eric was recently given a new Cadillac by his father. Now he drives his car day and night. Eric has a temper. He likes to make a ruckus and scandal out of nothing. The residents think it's because of his addiction to alcohol and other kinds of stupefied states of mind. But Eric lets everyone know that he doesn't like anyone even sober. Today, as luck would have it, it's Eric's turn to guard the chapel. Freddy, a local activist, has been chasing him around for a week, asking him to remember to come to the chapel in the evening and receive him properly. The other residents laugh at Freddy. How many times do you run after Eric? He still won't come to do this important tradition. Young people are irresponsible these days. They don't honor tradition, and they don't think about the future. This Eric will once again find an excuse to shirk his sacred duty. That's what the villagers of Listock thought. Eric didn't forget his sacred duty. Toward lunchtime, he drove his Cadillac to Freddy's house and asked him to keep the keys to the chapel. At precisely 5 o'clock p.m., I'll be waiting for you. There's a young man there, Freddy promised. No, that won't do. Come back at 4 o'clock p.m. I'll be ready to take chapel by then. Also, the next day, you don't have to be here by 900. How do you usually do it? You can come closer to lunchtime. I'm in no hurry to get anywhere, Eric said. Before, he was surprised at the untypical behavior of the local troublemaker, but he interpreted it as a good thing. Suddenly, the young man reconsidered his views and came to his senses. That happens to a lot of people. Everything happened as agreed. Only Freddy was awakened in the night by the screaming of the neighbors. Someone was yelling from the street to call the fire department and the paramedics. As Freddy pulled himself together and ran out of his house, all his neighbors were galloping away. Even yard dogs, small children, and sick old people were running. The chapel's on fire. That's bad luck. The chapel burned more than 180 years ago. Then it was the precursor to a series of floods. And the chapel burned before that. 234 years ago, immediately after that event, there was a massive earthquake. And then there was a war. A wall and old men clutching at their hearts. That's not good. It shouldn't have happened. We should not have allowed such a significant disaster for our village. The women grumbled. Only Eric sat aside on the curb and took a slow drag on a Cuban cigar, stroking the figure of his friend, who had fallen asleep from the amount of liquor drunk right on the lawn. He had fun watching those pesky people stir and fuss in an attempt to put out the fire. The fools would have slept on. No chapel, no more trouble, thought Eric and took a big gulp of whiskey straight from the neck of the bottle. The fire was out. People were starting to worry. Where was Norman's son Eric, who was an old-timer that evening? Had the young lad died inside the chapel? Norman had been against having anyone guarding the chapel from the beginning. Freddy had spent an hour talking him down, convincing him that the good traditions of the village must be preserved. How would Freddy look his friend in the eye now? The crowd was stirring again and actively discussing something among themselves. At this point, Eric decided to lie down and rest next to his girlfriend. Eric had hoped that after the fire, the villagers would have no more problems and each of them would live their own lives. But he had clearly underestimated them. Three days later, they gathered again at the old church 
and began to discuss how they would rebuild the chapel and how they would protect it from fires. None of them realized that Eric had set the fire on purpose, and he would do it as many times as he wanted. Tired of arguing about rebuilding the chapel, the residents decided to disperse today, and the problem will be solved next weekend when all the residents will feel in the appropriate spirit. Dispersing, Freddy and Norman walked down the main street. Norman hadn't been outside his garden for a long time. Today was the first time he had seen the outskirts of the settlement this year. There used to be an old abandoned house at the end of the street where no one lived. True, old Betty had told everyone that ghosts gathered in that abandoned house every night and held a coven. Nothing else is known about the house. The owners had either moved to town or sold the house. And today Norman noticed a new house three times the size of the old one has replaced the old one, and the roof is covered with pizza. In these areas, it was common to use broken skull structures, used by the most noble of families. Freddy, I don't get it. Are they building a new house here? Asked Norman. Don't you know what's going on? Freddy asked in a whisper. They say that the old haunted house bought the billionaire Edgar Nelson himself. He's going to move here, live here. They say he has a little time left. Freddy added. That's it. You're sure it's Edgar Nelson? Why did he choose our village? Asked Norman. Edgar shrugged his shoulders. Nelson was a hero of his era. This man is known for making a huge fortune in his younger years and doing a lot of good for society. After becoming an adult, he began to give lectures to students. Then people realized that Mr. Edgar was not only rich in money, but also in knowledge and wisdom. By his mature years, Edgar Nelson had become a true legend of his time. Even the most influential persons listened to his opinion. Without his participation, no important issue in the country was not solved. And so the people of this village were lucky to have him. Now this man of legend will be their neighbor. No matter how great a man he was, this Edgar Norman for some reason did not feel the joy of a new neighborhood, looking out for all the new residents. It's another tradition of this village. But Mr. Edgar would certainly win all the attention of the locals, and there's no telling what legends they'll start making about him. Norman came home with these thoughts. At that moment he again found his young wife Iris and his son Eric in the living room talking animatedly. Eric, feelings, emotions are all fleeting things. In such matters you have to think with your head and only then take action. You're still very young. You may not know the ins and outs of everything. So follow my advice, Iris says. I'm not only young, I'm handsome. Or don't you agree? Eric seems to be flirting with his stepmother, but it's undeniable. He's a handsome man, Iris tells him. As soon as they heard Norman's footsteps, the conversation stopped. Iris pretended that she had been waiting for her husband for a long time. Eric seemed to be going somewhere. He was dressed smartly and smelled of expensive perfume. It's a little different from his everyday outfit. Dad, you and I need to have a serious talk sometime, Eric said, when he got right to the front door. Let's talk now. I'm free now. While Eris is setting the table for us, said father. No, another time though. I'm expected now. I'll be late, said Eric, already closing the front door. His last words came from the street. Norman had been trying to keep his cool all evening and not show any signs of jealousy. And Iris kept asking him what he was so excited about and why he was so nervous. Norman only thought that tomorrow the first thing to do was to contact the detective and learn about the progress of surveillance of his closest people. He was afraid to think any further. Dude, why are you so sad? Asked Eric, his friend Jeffrey. As usual, they're out tonight at one of the bars in town. This is Eric Jeffrey's favorite place, his closest friend. Guys don't keep secrets from each other. You know what my home situation and prospects are like, Eric said. Still the same stepmother? Jeffrey asked. Yes, I'm trying to provoke her and find some reason for a scandal. But dude, it's not working. Eric's got his hands up in the air. What about dad? Jeffrey asked. And he spends all his time with her, 
as usual. In all likelihood, they're even planning a child. She's young and will have more than one. And then what will be left to me? My father's accounts and business. So it's been losing value over the last few years. And if he has, say, three children, it's not an inheritance, but some change for me, Herrick said. So you can't get rid of your stepmother? Jeffrey asked. No, I'm not. I deliberately talk to her about delicate subjects, so that she gets emotionally involved, so that my father will catch her flirting with me. Well, Dad doesn't see or hear all that, Eric said. And you know try a change of tactics. If verbal and provocation doesn't work on her, then try pretending that you have a crush on her as a woman. Show different signs of attention. Pretend that you are courting her. Trust me, women are addicted to these things. She's gonna let her emotions get in the way of your father. And that's when he'll kick her to the curb. Or maybe he'll think twice and decide to make up with your mother. After all, a woman of her age won't cause as much trouble as a younger woman. Jeffrey's advice. I was thinking the same thing. What if my father decides to take her side and makes an enemy of me? Then I'd lose my chance forever, Eric said. Even if he thinks that, it won't be for long. I know your dad. He's a normal dude. He understands a man's rules well. And men will never fight amongst themselves over a woman. Not even father and son. Even if he gets upset, it'll be for a while. And then you'll make up, Jeffrey said. Meanwhile, to Mr. Norman. The private investigator reported that the surveillance was continuing, but no significant clues could be found. Mr. Norman then decided to do a little investigation of his own. He invited his young wife Iris to a restaurant in the middle of a romantic evening. Norman as if casually began the conversation, Iris dear, I have long been unable to find time to spend with my son. I think he's growing apart from me. What do you think is going on in his life right now? Is there anything bothering him? Mr. Norman asked. That's right, you're really pulling away from him. I think he even blames me for all this, but he talks to me willingly, tells me about his girlfriends. He often consults with me about current affairs. I try to be friendly with him, but realize that no one can take your place in his life. So you should find a way to communicate with him at least once in a while," Iris replied. But overall, what do you think? He's not such a bad guy. I mean, the neighbors like to complain about his difficult personality. He's just like his mom. He's an adult. He can't be changed. Wouldn't his temper get in the way of his relationships with women? Norman asked a leading question. You've given him the best you can. Everyone has their strengths and weaknesses, including your son. I wouldn't say he's hopeless or unbearable. And the neighbors might say that out of jealousy, all in all, you have raised a fine son, Iris replied. After these words, Norman sank deeper into his doubts. His young wife speaks quite positively about his son. Can this be regarded as sympathy? Or is Iris just trying to be polite? Ah, why did he overhear this conversation? The news that Mr. Edgar had already moved into his new home quickly spread through the village, the villagers looking out of their windows to catch a glimpse of the man of legend. The young people were arguing about which automobile he most often drove. This mysterious man interested all indifferent nay, except Norman. And Iris was home alone. When Freddie came in, you and your husband and his son Eric are invited to visit tonight, Freddie said. Secretary Edgar Nelson himself has become our new neighbor. He's throwing a banquet for his housewarming party tonight. He wants to meet everyone in the village. Freddy said. Iris got excited. She remembered the not too distant past, and Iris and her friends were just beginning their modeling careers. There was such a secret competition in their circle as dating the cool worms. The most self-confident models boldly put on their list of the most successful men in the country and did not miss a single social party to get acquainted with any of them, and Iris was one such huntress. She had tried several times to make her way into the society of this Mr. Edgar, but she had failed. Then she took a close look at him and decided that he was kind of boring for a legendary person. At the same time, Iris dated various promising guys until she met Norman, 
an entrepreneur. Unlike the young, spoiled by the female attention of guys, the mature Norman was reliable. He had then already converted his relationship with his wife into an amicable one. According to him, Sarah did not mind it at all. On the contrary, she was glad to finally have her freedom. It was Norman who suffered for family harmony and the usual way of life. That's how spontaneously Iris found herself married to a middle-class businessman. At the moment when she had time to get used to stability in relationships and predictability right under the side, appears such a trophy as Edgar Nelson. And he invites her to visit. Usually these people are very private. And Edgar must have decided that this village is home to ordinary people and not to be shut out. Oh, honey, we're invited to a banquet tonight at our new neighbor's house, A. Iris announced over the phone. Is that old geezer calling? No, I'll pass. I'm not gonna waste my time with a con artist like that, Norman said. What makes you think he's a con man? It's all rumors and media speculation. They're usually people just like you and me. Well, please, let's go. He invited Erica to insisted, and through. After a long argument, Iris failed to persuade her husband to go together, but he agreed that she would go with Eric. They will briefly sit at the table, exchange a few phrases with this famous man, and then quickly return home. And Iris put on her best dress to meet her new neighbor. That's what all the other neighbors thought. In fact, all of her dresses were just as good. Mr. Edgar was surprisingly indifferent to women's beauty. He didn't even pay much attention to Iris. He thought someone had come with a teenage child. When the guests were served the second hot dish, Mr. Edgar asked for a moment of the audience's attention. Then he stood up and made a statement that left everyone speechless. I am very happy to be a neighbor to such wonderful people. Believe me, I've lived in a lot of places and I still do. I'm a pretty good judge of character. You're special. You make for a very interesting life. That's why I chose this village as my final resting place in this world. Few people know that I've been fighting an insidious disease for many years. I know that my outcome is near. Many people have a question about my inheritance. Who will inherit my money? I have no children and no other loved ones. I would like the honor of inheriting from one of you, Edgar said and paused. The guests froze waiting for him to continue his speech. But there is one interesting condition. I want to know two special persons among you. The best villager and the worst, said Edgar. The guests looked at each other and began to whisper among themselves. Some laughed, some were puzzled, some thought the old man was joking. Mr. Edgar, how do you know who among us is the worst and who is the best? Asked the same curious Freddy. Well, that's what we're going to talk about now. I will draw my conclusions from your feedback. From now on, and for the next six months, you can write me letters or come to a personal meeting to tell me about the worst and the best person among you. We will summarize the results in two stages. The first stage in three months, we will determine the worst. That is, you can tell me about the worst person first, and for the next three months, you and I together will look for the best of the best. Edgar said, what's the point of all this? Is it dismissive? Asked Eric, who until then had been sitting idly watching the others. Good question, my friend. To the best of you, I will give one million dollars. And whoever you appoint as the worst will have to guard your chapel for a year. By the way, I've allocated the money to restore it. And now it's a novelty. Do these conditions suit you? Mr. Edgar asked. Yes. It's a fascinating game. I'm curious, why not? Such phrases were heard from the crowd. Mr. Edgar understood that the audience accepted the terms of the game, and from tomorrow, all the most interesting things begin. And Iris came home in two bright feelings. Eric had been incredibly amused. What a quirky old man. He's obviously up to something and wants to fool everyone. And these gullible people believed him. He laughed. When he heard about the bet Mr. Edgar Norman had started, he was once again outraged. I guessed even from a distance that he is not the holy man he claims to be. He is a fraud and an imposter. He came here to sow confusion, grumbled Mr. Norman 
all evening and was curious as to what would happen next. It was only a week before Minister Edgar's mailbox was full of letters. No sooner had he read them than people started coming to him themselves to tell him about the worst man in the village. The first was the very same Freddy, a local activist. He came with a whole list. So Mr. Edgar, I have lived in this village for over 20 years, and I know every resident, and I know their whole background. If you're still interested, you listen. I'm very interested in Freddy telling me everything in detail. I want to know about everyone, Mr. Edgar said and stared at him. One of the worst people I would say is Norman Austin. He lives three houses down from you. Strange, I don't know anyone like that yet. Mr. Edgar wondered. That's right. He's a very secretive man, settled here only three years ago. He bought the house from some old people, remodeled it completely. He's lived here for three years, and none of us know anything about him. But we know he's got a young wife. He's got a son with a nasty temper. He's got a dog, that sort of thing. And the rest is a mystery. What exactly do you dislike about him? Mr. Edgar asked. All the other residents don't hide anything from each other. This one leaves early in the morning in his automobile as if from another planet. He arrives late. You don't see him around here much. In our community, normal men go out in the evenings and share the latest news. Talk about soccer and women. This mister here is a little too mysterious. I think it's because he's got something to hide. There's a reason he changed his residence and his wife to a new one when he was older. He's obviously got some skeletons in his closet. That's why this man is first on my list. Freddy said, he'll pass, and that's it. Or do you have some kind of personal score to settle with this man? I have personal scores too. I asked him for a loan once. He gave it to me, but I paid him back in time. But you know, I think he gave it to me with such an arrogant look. He obviously thinks badly of us, of the other villagers. For example, when you had your housewarming party, he didn't come to you. Do you know why? Because he treats all people badly. That's another confirmation of what I said. Okay, who else is on your list? Minister Edgar asked. Next on my list is his son Eric, who is a big boy, but he's a troublemaker. His father bought him a brand new Cadillac. So this young man, Instead of doing something useful, he rides around in that car all day long. He also tracks down the prettiest girls in our village, has fun with them a couple times, and then forgets about their fate. I suppose these girls will write to you about him in general too. This guy deserves the closest attention, Freddy said. Next on the list. Mr. Edgar listened attentively to his interlocutor. Next on the list is the worst person. I consider this Norman's young wife. And Iris is a model-looking girl who married a man who is old enough to be her father. I think she got together with him for a reason. It must be a matter of calculation. Immorality is a violation of morality. Freddy sounded like the leader of a political movement at a party meeting. Is there anyone else in your disfavor? Mr. Edgar remained at attention. Of course there is. It's our cop Andrew. He's not doing his job well. Mr. Edgar asked. No, no one has any complaints about his duties or his professionalism, but he's not friendly. A year ago, there was an accident at one of the houses. At that time, a cop, Andrew was working three days trade at the house. Now, when I and other villagers came up to him and asked him about the details of the accident, he kept it from us. So this man clearly has bad thoughts about us and is carefully hiding it. So the fourth bad man in this village is a cop, Andrew. So we'll put that down. Who's next? Freddy was so engrossed in his list that he didn't realize a couple hours had passed. He came to his senses when he noticed Mr. Edgar falling asleep in his seat intermittently from his stories. Freddy thought that Mr. Edgar himself must not be such a good person if he couldn't even listen to his fascinating story about all the inhabitants. Mr. Edgar's next visitor was a woman named Grace, who has also lived in this village for over 20 years. She did not have a list. What she did have was the absolute certainty that she was the one who knew the worst person in the village. This is my ex-husband, Evan. 
Grace said shyly. He left me with two kids and moved into his parents' old house. He lives there alone now. Sometimes he goes to church, sometimes he gets drunk and lies in the street. He absolutely refuses to live with us, Grace said. In all likelihood, your ex-husband is really not a good man. What would you wish for him? Mr. Edgar asked. Can you not be shy in your expressions and thoughts? I guarantee full understanding, added Mr. Edgar. I would wish for him to suffer just as I suffered in my marriage to him. Oh, how? I thought you were suffering without him. Mr. Edgar asked. I suffer without him too, but I suffered with him too. The thing is, I married Ivan early on, but then he went to serve in the army, and from there he came back as a strange man. He lived with us for a while, and then he left. Minister Edgar listened carefully to Grace's words, and the former even wrote something down, then escorted the offended woman home. When there was another free time, Mr. Edgar unexpectedly came to visit the very one who abandoned his family and drags with different women. Even was home alone. He was taken aback by the unexpected guest of honor. In the house there are certainly empty bottles and dirty things lying everywhere. Even himself doesn't look like the happiest person in the world. While Mr. Edgar sat in Even's living room and watched the arrangement of his space, a certain woman came out of the next room with a perplexed look at Mr. Edgar, then headed sharply toward the exit. Even caught up with her and asked her something. Obviously, he wanted to keep her for a while longer, but the woman was in a hurry. Ivan, you and I have known each other for a while. I came to see you to get to know you better. How are you doing? Mr. Edgar asked, and he was at a complete loss. He was very worried about his reputation among people. His departure from the family was received with condemnation by the others. Everyone said he'd be lost without the support of the strong grace. But even had his own plans and his own vision of life. He was determined to prove something to the contrary. He needed a little time. Except this visit from Mr. Edgar was not a good idea. There's no telling what he'll tell the others about him. I've been doing all kinds of things. I live like everybody else. It's true I have some difficulties in my life, but I'll get over them. Even started making excuses. Don't worry, it's okay. Maybe you could get $1 million from me and rebuild your life. That's what I'm talking about. Your ex-wife came to see me. She thinks you're the worst person in the village because you abandoned your family and moved into your parents' old house. I was curious to see the worst man amongst my own. That is, in fact, what I am here, said Mr. Edgar in a soft tone, and Ivan sat silent for a long time. Mr. Edgar realized that he had stepped on something very painful for this man. He didn't expect the reaction to be so strong. He was clearly distressed about something. To be honest, my grace wasn't telling you the whole truth. Finally, Ivan started talking. Actually, it all started when I came back from military service. It changed me a lot. I became very nervous, and I had a hard time tolerating others. My wife probably didn't tell you all this. I had a hard time sleeping at night. I kept waking up with nightmares. I told Grace I needed time and space to recover. But she thought I had fallen out of love with her. I walked away from my family to shut them out of my life. I knew that just a little bit more, and I could hurt them, raise my hand or start insulting them. I'm here to sort myself out to become that calm and upbeat person. I don't know how to do that, but I believe that someday it will happen and I'll get back to my loved ones. In the meantime, yes, I am a bad person. I know it myself, Even said and cried like a little child. Mr. Edgar sat in Even's house for a long time. Eventually he realized that this man had indeed become so small in his soul that he could not stand to be around other people. Mr. Edgar nodded his head repeatedly. When Ivan talked about himself, he had long ago guessed that some events, even insignificant at first glance, can make a person very small in his eyes. Such a person becomes quite embittered. Since the little beast inside is frightened, he is constantly on guard and cannot relax for a minute. Even turned out to be actually not a bad person and unhappy Mr. Edgar promised to help him in the future.
and for himself he decided that the bad should be sought elsewhere. The next guests surprised Mr. and Edgar very much. There were about ten of them. They were all teenagers of this village. We found out that you can be told about the best people of this village. If you don't tell our secret to anyone, we are ready to point out the worst person to you," said one of the teenagers. Minister Edgar became very interested. He gave the teenagers the floor and sat in a chair with a pencil and paper in his hands. All the adults in this village are the worst people in the world. They don't understand us. They think we are still children, but we are no longer children," said the first teenager. Then the second of them reached out his hand and stepped forward. Apparently, he too had a problem with adults. And in some cases, we're asked to be adults, even though we're not adults," said the second teenager. What do they want from you? Mr. Edgar asked. The teens hesitated, and each began to list a different thing. They want us to be able to do everything, everywhere. And we don't have any rights. They make us do things we don't like. They make us study subjects that won't do us any good in the future. It's as if they have forgotten that they themselves come from childhood. They steal our freedom and limit our development. The teenagers said with one voice. Mr. Edgar thought deeply. When he announced his bet, he didn't think the kids would be interested in it either. But since the rules were getting complicated, Mr. Edgar decided to accept them. He asked, and can you specifically give me the names of people who can be categorized as the worst? That's my mom, Grace. That's my dad, even my dad, Freddie. My grandmother, Betty. Our neighbor, Norman's teacher, Ted, Mr. Cop. It seems these young men and women have decided to list all the residents of this village in three generations. Mr. Edgar wrote down all the names and then thanked the young activists and escorted them out of his house. The game is gaining very interesting momentum, he said to himself, and shook his head. Mr. Edgar's next destination was the local school. There he got to know the teacher, Ted, better. Just that day, there was a school parent meeting. All the adults who had children, school children, were gathered in the hall. Ted addressed them and outlined a number of problems. They were typical of any school. Ted spoke very emotionally. One of the parents objected to him, demanding even more discipline than there is now. Then Ted said that children should be given more space for freedom, that they have the right to decide about their free time. He also talked a lot about the peculiarities of growing up. From time to time, he reminded the parents that they too were children and experienced difficulties. In the end, the impression was that Ted was completely on the side of the children. The parents were satisfied. For Mr. Edgar, it wasn't enough. After all the conversations, he stayed at the school a little longer and talked to Ted personally. Returning home, he was sure that Ted was not the worst person in the village and the parents showed no signs of cruelty. But the children were right about something too. As Mr. Edgar gathered a history on each resident in the Norman household, something strange was happening and Iris noticed that Eric had also spent all night last night at a nightclub toward morning, and had come in drunk, and was still asleep. In the morning when Norman was leaving for work, he asked him to tell him to have Eric at his office by lunchtime, and Iris decided to give this to Eric closer to lunchtime. When she went into his room on the second floor, Eric was already out of bed. Eric, good morning, your dad told me to tell you to report to his office. He said it was serious, Iris said, and hurried back out of his room. But Eric blocked her way. Wait, Iris, you don't have to run away from me. If anyone needs to talk, it's you and me. He said and stepped closer to her. It was that awful moment that Iris had been dreading all along. She has been walking like the tip of a needle since the beginning of her married life, so as not to provoke this spoiled guy. Iris felt perfectly well that the previous frank conversations and attempts to draw out of her some emotions and other things are all tricks of this guy. She realizes that Norman frankly pays more attention to her and spends little time with his son. But the son never assumes that his father is doing this willingly. He sees his stepmother as a major rival. And yes, Eric is in close contact with his mother. 
She's probably there to give him a lot of pointers on how to gain more space in his father's life. Even though she has no intention of returning to her beloved husband, sharing his privileges with another woman is particularly reluctant. No matter how hard Iris tries to maneuver, now she's on the verge of a major trap. Eric, please don't cross the line. It will end badly for both of us. Iris tried to push him away from her and headed for the exit. You think I'm a little kid and don't notice anything. I've been seeing it all for a long time. The way you've been grooming me from all sides. I know your plans are devious. You want to compromise me in my father's eyes. That's why I'm maneuvering like a knife edge. But you don't have to fear any of this if you obey me. I won't tell your father about your open provocations. If you stay close to me, Eric insisted. What are you talking about? Eric, this is crazy. It's not my fault. Please stop acting like a capricious child. Iris was getting seriously worried. What kind of provocation are you talking about? I'm only trying to be on friendly terms with you. You and I have one person in common. He's close to you and me. What makes you think I have a personal affection for you? Iris raised her voice to you. Oh, come on. Your flashy outfits, your clever facial expressions, your smiles. I've been noticing it for a long time. Don't worry, don't worry. No one will ever find out. Eric continued to hold Iris' hand. After a short verbal altercation, Iris gathered all her strength into a fist, and she managed to break free from Eric's hands. She ran swiftly down the stairs until she took one wrong step and rolled headlong down the stairs. Eric heard a rumble and ran out following her down the stairs, and there lay the girl's frail body with blood running from her nose. Eric came running and picked her up and put her on the couch in the living room. He was terrified. He had no idea how to give a person help. In cases like this, in a hurry, he ran into the kitchen, struggled to find the home first aid kit, but it contained only neatly folded bandages and nothing else. So Eric ran to the phone to call a doctor. But he realized that the doctor would not arrive here soon. It was almost an hour's drive from the city to the village. Eric decided to drive Iris to the hospital in his car. Why did I listen to Jeff? She was the one who fell down the stairs when she was scared of me. I wasn't really going to touch her. What kind of day is this? Thought Eric as he stepped on the gas of his car. Meanwhile, Iris's face had turned blue and tinged, and her body was hanging out of the back seat of the car like a bag of vegetables. When my father finds out, I can't avoid trouble. She might tell him why she ran up the stairs like that, too, right? Eric thought, and he felt even more uneasy. Meanwhile, Mr. Edgar's experiment continues. Several people come to him every day to tell him the worst behaviors and traits of their acquaintances, friends, or just fellow villagers. And Edgar was greatly surprised when a group of teenagers came to him. He hadn't expected such an active response. And today, he was even more surprised when a local cop came to see him. Turns out he knows who the worst person in this village is. Mr. Edgar, I know how to end crime in any community. It takes the good work of the so-called vice squad. In this case, it's the rector of the church. And instead of educating people, he collects money from the church and organizes religious festivals. Meanwhile, people often steal, beat each other up, damage each other's property. All because the churchmen are not doing their duties well enough. I don't think God will forgive him for that either. He himself says, it is better to receive his punishment on earth than in heaven after death. I followed his idea of appointing him the worst inhabitant of this village and let him do the dirtiest work in our village. It will be better for him than burning in hell after death, the cop said. Minister Edgar listened attentively and was struck by the depth of Koba's arguments. You have been another revelation to me, Mr. Edgar said and wrote down all of Koba's arguments in his notebook. Hearing such a serious accusation, Mr. Edgar decided a few days later to visit the churchman in person and talk to him. When he arrived, indeed, the church was empty, with no one present. Father, why is there no one in the church on the day of service? Minister Edgar asked, you know, these are the times. People have turned away from God, 
They have sold their souls to the devil and become dependent on the poor world, and they don't have the time or energy to go to church. A couple of years ago, one of the active ones even proposed to demolish this church and build a nightclub instead. God save us from such a thing, said the rector and crossed himself. Are you saying that people have forgotten about God? Mr. Edgar asked. That's exactly what I'm saying, but it's not their fault. God loves people infinitely. The proof of this love is the fact that he gave mankind the devil. What are you saying, Father? How does that make sense? How can the devil be a gift to human beings? Minister Edgar marveled. It's very simple. God gave the devil so that man could blame all his sins on him. It is a great opportunity to repent every time after committing a sin and every time to return to the abode of the Holy Father, said the abbot. Yes, you're right. There is something in it. Father, may I ask you a question? Mr. Edgar asked. I'm all ears. One of the important people in this village came to see me yesterday. If you know, I recently asked the people of this village to identify the worst person among them. Well, this important man thinks the worst person is you. Do you know why? Because you don't preach well enough, and people fall into sin through ignorance, said Mr. Edgar. A fellow cop pressed me. It was expected. We have an old conflict with this man. When I was a young man, there lived in our neighborhood an unprecedented beauty named Aria. I was young, handsome, educated, and rich, and a fellow cop at the time was starving. Both of us were attracted to this beautiful girl Aria, but the beautiful maiden chose me as her bow over the cop. He and I have been secret enemies ever since, so don't believe a word he says against me. It's because of youthful resentment and jealousy, the priest said. Ah. That's how it is. Interesting story. As far as I know, you are now living about a beautiful girl. Arise no, in your life. Mr. Edgar asked. Yes, that's right. My love turned out to be miserable. I didn't know who I was involved with this beautiful girl turned out to be a companion. I found out about it very late. When I found out, I was already hopelessly fixed with her. I did everything I could to get her on the right path and stop sinning. But all was in vain. Suffering from heart itches, I acquired a host of diseases, body and mind. And in the end, she left me anyway and chose a licentious lifestyle. She still hosts rich gentlemen to this day. When I look at all this, I am weak and feeble. On days like this, I'm not even able to preach, the priest said. Father, do you think this is a beautiful area, good man or bad man? Mr. Edgar asked, how can a companion and a traitor be a good person? My whole life has gone down the drain because of her. Even now, after she is long gone from my life, she continues to live in the house across the street and do dishonor to me. Every time I look at her, I feel how far from holiness I am, the priest said, and his voice became agitated. Mr. Edgar had a very interesting picture in his mind. Mr. Edgar had a very interesting picture in his mind. The culprit was a certain grandmother who had led a vicious life many years ago in her distant youth. Now we should talk to this beautiful girl. Aria thought to himself, Mr. Edgar. A few days later, he visited this woman by name. He expected to see a beautiful girl, but he made a slight mistake in his introduction. The now beautiful girl had turned into a charismatic woman of mature age. From the looks of it, you couldn't tell that she was the source of the falling morals of this entire village. Aria greeted her guest in a very flirtatious manner. I heard that an honorable gentleman like you has settled in our village. I've been looking for a chance to get to know you. And this is such an unexpected, pleasant meeting, she said. I've never heard anything about you. I wonder why your fellow villagers didn't mention a fine woman like you. Mr. Edgar got in on the act. That's a good thing. I know a lot of them are jealous of me. They're afraid that all your attention will be on me. They only want to make the most of you on their own account. And how are you doing? How is your life going? Mr. Edgar asked, slowly looking around the interior of Ares dwelling. Everything here spoke for itself. The fiery red walls hinted at passions. 
On the wall are elegant candle holders with candles blazing and a light fragrance. On the table are two sparkling glasses waiting for the clear wine that Apple always has in stock. Nearby lie some other sweets in beautiful wrappers. The woman herself is dressed in a long cool robe, from behind which her seductively long legs brazenly peek out. I live my life as best I can. I've been judged for my lifestyle, of course, but I once made the decision not to resist my desires. That's why my paths went in different directions with the local church rector. He aspired to the sublime, and I epitomized the niche, Aria said and grinned. That's actually something I'd like to talk to you more about. Why do you want to talk about all this? Aria asked. That's a very good question. Are you the first person to ask that? The others chose to join in silently. Mr. Edgar said, You should know that I achieved everything many years ago, a long time ago. I have no need to think about my daily bread. All my worldly questions are solved for three generations ahead. When I had achieved all this, I asked myself, What do I want next? It was an excruciatingly difficult question. Usually, when people reach the top, there is a precipitous downward slide afterward. I knew this, and feared it. After much agonizing reflection, I found the answers in my soul. I want to know human nature. From that moment on, and my already beautiful life was completely transformed. My wealth became less important. It became important for me to see something in each person that others don't have. My game of determining the best and the worst also comes from this. I wonder how you could have come straight to me. I would have told you right away what each person is like. All my life, I've yet to meet a man who can hear the truth about himself and not run away from it. I've never met anyone like that. I see you're already looking forward to that kind of knowledge, Aria said. You are quite right. People prefer to avoid themselves all the time. I've seen that time and time again. By putting them through various realistic tests. Following the rules of my game, I recently visited the church rector. He told me that you broke his heart and became a sacred wound in his life. Because of this, he cannot become truly holy and lead others to holiness. So the worst person in this village is you. Do you agree with that? Mr. Edgar asked. He was a little worried that the woman might be offended or angry. But Aria remained calm, just as cheerful. But finally Aria exclaimed and clapped her hands together. At last these people have begun to think, albeit with your help. They're finally thinking about who is truly good and who is truly bad. I hope this knowledge will help them to be truly happy. I always said that I was the worst person not only in this village, but in the whole world, Aria said and threw her hands to her sides. And Edgar was surprised. It was the first time he had ever seen a man speak of his unhappy plight with such joy and pride. He decided not to interrupt the lady. In fact, they all want to live like I do every morning to make themselves beautiful, to put on the most beautiful clothes, to stay at home and fool around all day with breaks to eat good food, drink good wine, and meet only such people who come for real pleasures. They cannot even in their wildest dreams afford my daily life. I am at my lowest standards, and I am also paid generously for it. I have no worries except to look seductive and be in a good mood. That's my shortcoming. Did your church rector, when he was my life partner, truly hate me for it? I realized at that time that I did not have the strength and desire to strive for higher things as he did. Therefore, I did not cling to him and our life together. I let him go to his aspirations of his soul. If he is suffering now, it is because he would like to live his life as I do but he did not find the strength for it. But he skillfully pretends to be the truest and most honest man in this village, Maria said. Is there anyone you can call the worst person in the village, other than yourself? Edgar decided to clarify, since this was the first time he had encountered such honesty. No, of course not. They're all good people. The other thing is me. I think I'm the worst person in the world because of the way I live my life. And the proof of that is the fact that I'm also proud of it and not pretending to be different from who I really am," Aria said. 
This interesting conversation went on for quite some time and Edgar was quite surprised. He had met 1,000 different people in his life, but he had not met someone like this woman very often. On his way home, he met Freddy. He asked about the results of the experiment. Secretary Edgar, how's your research coming along? We need to determine who will guard the chapel as soon as possible, he said. I'm afraid your expectations will fail. The man who, by your standards, has turned out to be the worst of you, is not fit to guard the chapel. She's a promiscuous woman. She's admitted it herself. But why not a teacher? Why not a priest? Why not a cop? Or even Norman? Freddy asked in surprise. Because they don't recognize themselves as such. And as long as a man thinks someone else is bad, he doesn't see the bad part of himself. That was my personal theory. And once again, it was confirmed. And the results will be quite surprising to you. Mr. Edgar said. That was the end of his experiment. Now he knows everything about the inhabitants of this village, and the worst of them is the unremarkable Rasputin, a woman who lives on the outskirts of the village. But that's the crowd's version. Meanwhile, Iris has only been in hospital for three days. Norman was away on a business trip that day, and Iris decided not to say anything about what had happened so that her husband would not worry. But she didn't tell Eric anything about it, he was worried that his stepmother would get into trouble with his father. That's why all these three days did not leave the door of the hospital, taking care of stepmother. Through anger and hatred for her, the address was written out the day before Norman came home. She greeted her husband as if nothing had happened. Only Eric avoided seeing his father. He stayed out of his sight for days, and when he finally calmed down, he decided to continue his offensive toward his stepmother to get rid of her. That afternoon, it was just the two of them at home again. Iris was busy with household chores. She now became very careful, does not enter the room where Eric is sitting, trying to stay on the first floor of the house so that in case of danger to escape, someone knocked on the gate. And since she went to open it, in front of her stood Mr. Edgar. What an unexpected encounter. Hello. If you remember, you and I are neighbors. My name is Mr. Edgar. Yes, of course I remember. How could anyone forget you? It came out of Iris' mouth. If you'll allow me, I'd like to be your guest for a while. Is that possible? Mr. Edgar asked kindly. Yes, of course, come in. We are not at home, but his son and I are. By the way, Eric is also interested in your achievements in biography. And before I knew it, I was floating in front of this gentleman. At home, Mr. Edgar carefully examined the situation, periodically asked different questions, and I was surprised by the curiosity of this man. It was said about him that he had a cool disposition and a very unpredictable character. And now he was acting like one of the most typical people in this village. As for Eric's interest, Iris certainly embellished a bit. He was just as skeptical as his father that a legendary millionaire, a scandalously famous man was their new neighbor. And when Eric learned that he had thought up some kind of experiment among the residents, and the winner guaranteed one, zero, 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 zero dollars, he laughed at all, considering it for nonsense. Hearing the conversation in the living room, Eric decided to go downstairs and see who had come to see them. Seeing Mr. Edgar, Eric was a little displeased. Eric Nelson, I've heard a lot about you, kid. How you doing? Why don't you come sit down and talk to us? Let's get to know each other like buddies. Edgar said hello. What brings you here? I like to meet new people. I thought I'd drop by. I was told there were some wonderful people living here, Edgar said. Well, they lied to you. I can tell you the truth. There are no great people here. My father lives here, who left his wife and three children, and left home. His young wife lives here, a former model, and a bit of an actress in life. She is, in fact, sitting in front of you. It's also where myself and Norman's no good son live. A drunk, a spoiled bully, and a rebel. Which one of us is the most wonderful? So don't believe these people from our village, said Eric. Do I like you, boy? That's what they told you about that too. 
Besides, most of your fellow villagers think you are the first candidate for the worst person in this village. Is it encouraging that you know the truth? Mr. Edgar grinned. In fact, you've been up to an idiotic thing. I know you actually have other goals in mind. At the very least, you want to turn all the residents against each other. And none of them are getting any of the one million dollars. Now I don't understand why you're doing this. If you were a woman, I'd be sympathetic. Only women are interested in such things, Eric said. Iris felt embarrassed that Eric was being so insolent towards such an important man. Edgar noticed it too. Eric, you're free to think as you see fit, but my truth remains the truth. You'll see, someone will get one million dollars from me, and I'll do it in front of everyone else, and someone else will have to watch and care for the old chapel all year. Could it be you? I'm ready to get started today because I know how to solve this trifling problem once and for all. Tomorrow morning these people will have the ruins of their chapel again. Now that's the normal solution, Eric said. As much as Mr. Edgar tried to build a dialogue, he failed to connect with Eric. In all likelihood, the other residents are right. This Tarek is really unfixable, he thought, while he looked at Iris carefully and pondered Eric's words. The former model is a bit of an actress, should be an interesting match for a little fling. Such a thought flashed through his mind, but he quickly switched to other conversations. It was a very ordinary family evening in Norman's household, and Iris was setting the table. Eric woke up. Recently, Norman wanted to talk to his son, but he promised that all the talk would be later, and Eric himself, out of habit, rushed to his friends, who had already planned entertainment for that night. But that was just an excuse. Or tonight he had important business to attend to, and he did not intend to be distracted by entertainment. As Norman and Iris sat at the table, someone knocked on the door. Iris went to open the door. In front of her stood a middle-aged man of tall stature, stylishly dressed and smelling good. He was holding a bouquet of flowers and a large box with a ribbon. Hello, darling. It's okay that I came to see you so unexpectedly. Really, I called at night, and you didn't pick up," said the strange man. Then put his arm around Ariz's waist and kissed him vigorously on the lips. Excuse me, who are you? asked Iris, when with difficulty managed to get out of the strange man's embrace. Yes, stop pretending. Or is this some kind of game? Well, if you're getting me into the game, then I don't mind at all. I know how good you are in different roles, says the man, and again with a kiss, and Iris pushed him away with difficulty. Men, I don't know you. Leave me alone and go away. She resented him. I understand. Baby, you missed me. Is it okay for a sweet little thing like you to be cranky? You said so yourself on the phone. And then she got mad. She wanted to yell at the man but he's unpredictable. His behavior clearly raises a lot of questions. The struggle went on for quite some time. The unfamiliar man would not admit to being a stranger. When Norman heard shouting and cursing, he also left the house. Turns out that's what this is all about. Hello, Mr. Norman. And Iris, dear. Now I can see why you've been so angry. But I think it's time we told your husband the truth. How long can you and I hide? says the man. Norman, I don't know him. This is the first time I've seen this man. Please don't take his word for it. I have nothing with him. And Iris was almost crying. The more Iris explained herself, the more insolent the strange man behaved. He tried to keep her close, to hold her in his arms and press her against him. Norman saw that in the strange man's hands was a bouquet of Iris's favorite flowers and a box of red, just the way she likes it. I don't understand you. What do you want in my house? Norman was trying to figure out what was even going on. The thing is, Iris and I love each other. I've been telling her to come clean for a long time, but she feels sorry for you. She thinks you'll figure it out and let her go. It's a good thing you saw for yourself. You shouldn't have any questions now, the strange man said. No. None of this is true. This is the first time I've ever seen this man. 
screamed Iris, and she was almost hysterical. Norman stood there in complete incomprehension. I got it right. Iris is very afraid of you. I will leave you both to accept the new reality. Mr. Norman, I hope you don't see the woman you and I love. And with you, my dear, we'll call you in the next few days, said the stranger. The man left his gifts on the threshold and left leisurely. Turning the corner, the strange man took out his cell phone and dialed a number. Eric, buddy, mission accomplished. Cool. You made all this up. You should have seen the look in your stepmom's eyes. I think she's gonna get a good kick out of your father. He was almost on edge, but as a well-mannered man he could barely control himself, said the strange man. Rome, you have an underrated acting talent, and I've always believed in you. Thanks, buddy. Now come on, get a cab, and come to us. Is your reward waiting for you? Eric answered him. Old man Edgar called Freddy to his house again today. He hadn't been in the village for a long time. Now he decided to make up for lost time. It seems that you and I have some important business to attend to. Gather all the villagers. I have something to tell them, Edgar said. Hearing the new invitation, the villagers hurried back to Igor's house. Of course, the rich table and the exquisite treats were interesting to them. But even more interesting, who did Edgar decide to appoint as the worst person? Who is the one who will now carry the stigma of disgrace for an entire year? Every resident is sure that Edgar made his decision with exactly his advice in mind. When the whole village gathered and enjoyed the rich treats, with these, Mr. Edgar again asked for everyone's attention. If you remember, I was announcing a little experiment. I have gathered you here today to summarize the preliminary results. I have found that there are no sinless among you. Some of you have brought me lists of bad people. Some of you have come to me several times to convince me of your vision. Some of you I myself have personally gone to and tested how bad you are. Before I announce my decisions, I would like to ask you to express your guesses as to which of you will hold the title of the worst man in the village. Mr. Edgar added more intrigue. The guests glanced amongst themselves. Mr. Edgar looked at each of them, waiting for them to respond. But no one was in a hurry to offer an opinion. Come on in, maybe you have an opinion. Mr. Edgar turned to one of the most active participants in his experiment. Mr. Edgar, I have lived in this village for over 20 years, and I know everyone. Each of them has their own faults and virtues. I think each of my fellow villagers is well aware of their peculiarities. I believe that I have no right to interfere in such aspects of their lives, so I have nothing to add." Freddy said. Mr. Edgar nodded his head approvingly. He had conducted such experiments many times before. He knew for a fact that the participants would say different words depending on the situation. Freddy, for example, he was one of the most active participants who brought whole blacklists. And when all these people were gathered around the same table, he very politely recanted his words. Father, perhaps you have something to say. As the spiritual leader of this community, you know more than anyone. Do you think there is a fault in people or some of the unpleasant things that are happening in our community? Is it the work of the devil himself? Mr. Edgar turned to the priest. The priest was clearly not ready for a frank conversation at the table. Both good and bad come from the man himself. If he has a connection with the Lord God, then of course his thoughts will be pure. But if a person has not gone off the right path and has turned down the path of sin, then shame and dishonor will not escape him. Our Lord guaranteed that bad deeds will be hidden from his eyes. He promised to help spread the glory in every way possible until the person himself began to tell others about them and our good deeds. Following that, I would prefer to remain in the shadows the priest said. The man once more confirmed Mr. Edgar's supposition. Before, why don't I see Mrs. Area among the guests? Asked Mr. Remembering the beautiful mature woman leading a Rasputina lifestyle. The priest shuddered. He was worried that this millionaire for fun and laughter might tell his dramatic story with this Rasputina woman. He perked up, looking around. Freddy was also taken aback, but not confused. Minister Edgar, 
Aria's companion said she had other plans for tonight. But she promised that she would be sure to visit you at the first opportunity, Freddy said. After that, Freddy and the priest looked at each other. The priest nodded his head slightly. That meant that he would not be indebted. No one knew that the priest had set a condition for Aria not to attend this evening. Therefore, Freddy had not even informed her of Mr. Edgar's invitation. It was further proof of the man's hypocrisy, but she remained out of Mr. Edgar's sight. Instead, he abruptly changed the topic of conversation and turned his attention to the treats for the guests. The crowd, which had been curiously awaiting the name Shame. Nika was left bewildered. Apparently, it would have to wait a while longer for the name of that unfortunate man to be announced. The guests ate, drank, talked among themselves, amused themselves. From the outside, one would have thought that the villagers had no grievances against each other. As the evening drew to a close, one of the guests lost patience. Minister Edgar, we've already guessed that you've invited us here for an important occasion. We know you're going to announce the name of the unfortunate one who was the worst of us. What is your choice? Who have you determined to be the best? The man asked. That's a good question. I was expecting it. Edgar said and rose from his seat. He walked around the long table where all his neighbors were sitting. Every guest's gaze was fixed on him. This is not the first time I have conducted an experiment here. As you know, I am a very wealthy man. I buy houses in different cities and towns. Among them, there are gated elite areas. And there are youth neighborhoods. They are located in different countries. Every time I settle in a new place, I organize some miracle contest. And you know, every time, the results are exactly the same. They're similar even in the smallest details. Is that interesting to you? Or should we stop here? Mr. Edgar stopped and asked the guests. The guests expressed their willingness to listen to him further. They still had not given up hope of hearing the name of the worst man among them. Each one of them was sure that it was definitely not him. Meanwhile, Mr. Edgar continued his story. So let it be known to all of you that he came to me with a list of the worst people, each and every one of you. And let it be known that each and every one of you has been repeatedly listed by others as the worst person. So there is no point in singling out a particular person. The point of my experiment is for you to realize that no one is a saint. You should also remember that there is always someone who is against you. I don't know what you should do with this knowledge. But you must always remember that from another's point of view, each of you stands on the same level," said Mr. Edgar. And who will guard the chapel? Asked one of the guests. That's for you to decide. How did you usually do it before? Mr. Edgar asked. The guests became sad at first, and then even a little indignant. They came here for the spectacle. And to them, this man read them a moral. Mr. Edgar noticed the mood of the crowd. To lighten the mood, he asked his servants to bring a new batch of fine food and good wine. But the guests were no longer as lively as they had been at the beginning of the evening. When dessert was served, Mr. Edgar again asked for the audience's attention. As you know, that was only the first part of the contest. There is still a second part. Now I am waiting for your feedback on the best person among you. And it's gonna be even more exciting than it was before. And remember, you only have 30 days. You may not nominate yourself as the best person. It has to be another person from this village. The one the others say is the best. In exactly 30 days, one million dollars will come out of my hands right in front of your eyes. Are you ready? Mr. Edgar turned to the audience. The guests looked at each other and thought again. What a challenge. This time Iris didn't attend the dinner party at Mr. Edgar's house. Those were not the easiest days of her life. After a strange man visited unexpectedly with a bouquet of flowers and gifts, Norman had many questions for his young wife. Barely escorting the annoying stranger out, they both returned to the house as soon as they crossed the threshold. Iris began to explain herself. Norman, honestly, this is the first time I've seen this man. Do you really think I'm capable of treason? I don't know what that person wanted, but I certainly had nothing to do with it. 
Norman was silent for a long time in response. If he had been passionately watching the news on television before, now all his thoughts were occupied with something else. He did not respond to his wife's words, only stared thoughtfully at one point. I suppose this man could have mixed up the address, said in a quiet voice as she tired of her husband's heavy silence. It's possible to mix up an address, but damn it, he knows you. He brought your favorite peonies and the sweets you love. How do you explain that to me? Norman finally gave it up. I can't explain it. If you believe me, then help me understand this situation, said Iris. Many people told me that my young wife might be cheating on me. I've dismissed such nonsense every time. But for some reason in my life, more and more facts hint at something bad, said Norman. Who's telling you these things? Maybe these people have set such a trap for me. Why didn't you tell me that in the first place? And what facts are you talking about? I've cheered up. Never mind all that. In fact, I've been wanting to talk to you about my son for a long time. I overheard you and him talking the other day. You were talking about some kid. Then I overheard you talking about something very personal. What is that supposed to mean? Norman exploded. You heard a snippet of our conversation about Eric's friend's girlfriend. Your son Eric tells me all the time about the adventures of his friends. This time he relayed that his friend Jeffrey doesn't know what to do with his friend who got him pregnant. Jeffrey, who's a frequent visitor. That's who we were talking about. Do you have any more questions? Iris shuddered with anger at her husband. Why do you have so many private conversations with him anyway? I'm just trying to keep up a polite dialogue with him. He tells me stories. I share my opinions. You barely talk to him at all. You just give him commands. The rest of the time, you pay him off with money. Didn't you think the boy needed your support and company? Why should I support your relationship? Yesterday, Iris finally came clean. He's not a boy. He's 23 years old, and he's about to become the manager of my company. He's not a girl to be handled and listened to all the time. And I give him enough money to make him feel free. He needs to make connections. He needs to find his place in a certain circle where money is very important. Any other questions? Now Norman exploded. I was very offended. That you thought ill of me and my son. Do you even hear what you're accusing me of? Said Iris. How am I supposed to think when a strange man comes straight to my house with gifts and kisses you on the lips? What else am I supposed to think? The verbal altercation turned into a long family scandal. When the spouses were tired of yelling at each other, Norman decided to end the conversation. Now, my dear, I'm giving you three days time. During that time, you and I will not discuss or fight. During that time, you will think hard about how you and I are going to proceed. Either I have to stop getting facts that compromise you, or you have to make a choice, Norman said. What do you mean, make a choice? Iris asked. It means you're going to choose either me or that strange man. So you're suggesting that I break up with you. We can break up because you don't believe what I say and you believe whoever you want. Iris asked, through tears. And if you want that not to happen, then please give me a reasonable explanation for what's going on, not empty excuses. I'm done. And by the way, which one of us is sleeping in the living room? You or me, said Norman last. I said Iris quietly. When Eric suddenly ran out of money at the restaurant, he was a little upset. The task turned out to be quite unfortunate. He was just about to take his friends to a nightclub after the restaurant. It would take a decent amount of money. So he turned to his friend Jeffrey. How about you pay for everyone tonight? And tomorrow I'll pay you the full amount for the movie, Eric asked. I'm sorry, buddy, but you know I don't have that kind of money. Besides, you invited everybody. You're going to have to do a lot of work yourself, my friend said. Are you right? I don't have any money on me. We'll have to go home. Tell the girls we're going out for a while. Have them wait for us here, and you and I will go to my house, said Eric. After half an hour, Eric and Jeffrey sneaked into the house. They didn't know that Iris was lying down in the living room. Eric carefully opened his father's safe while Jeffrey stood in the hallway. After a few moments, 
Jeffrey turned to his friend. Eric, I feel like I'm being drawn to sleep. Do you have any coffee? Let's have a quick drink. It's going to be a little hard to drive, said his friend. Now they moved into the kitchen. The kitchen and the living room are separated by a thin partition. So even whispers can be heard from here. When the coffee was ready, the boys sat down at the table and chatted among themselves in whispers. So is your father still hung up on that woman? Jeffrey asked. Unfortunately, yes, but it won't last long. Your advice didn't work. I came up with a cool way to do it myself. Last week, I approached Roma with a bouquet of flowers and gifts, so he could pretend to be my stepmom's lover. And that's when my dad was home, Eric said. Wow, you're a genius, man. So, what are the results? Your dad probably kicked her out the door. Asked Jeffrey with a chuckle. What's the matter with her? She's still hanging around. I think she managed to convince my father of her sainthood. We'll have to do it again in the next few days. Then she won't stand a chance, Eric said. Then they stoked their coffee, turned off the light, and quietly closed the door behind them. Neither of them even realized that Iris was lying just behind the partition during this time in agonizing thoughts about her position in this family. After the boys left and Iris got up from her seat and lit a cigarette in the kitchen, she was calm now. A brilliant idea popped into her head, how to come out of this situation victorious. She decided to spring into action tomorrow. Mr. Edgar had taken a few days leave to devote to his neighbors, who would come with suggestions for the best man among them. He remembers the last time he had to determine the worst. Several people came to him every day. He thought it would be the same this time. For the first three days, no one came. Then Mr. Edgar went to Freddy and asked if everyone was okay. Freddy wondered, why such questions? Has everyone forgotten that $1 million is at stake? I'm waiting for the candidates, said Mr. Edgar. Is that what you mean? I don't even know why no one comes. Freddy shrugged. Well, Freddy yourself, who would you say is the best person among your neighbors, relatives, friends, and fellow villagers? I'm sure you have some, Mr. Edgar said. I can't think of any. Think back. Maybe you've had some rough times in your life. Someone reached out to you. Someone gave you a kind word of encouragement, just one person. Minister Edgar insisted. No, I don't remember anyone like that. Mr. Edgar, I grew up an orphan. I made it on my own, built my own house, planted my own garden, bought my own van, started my own farm. Of course, there were many times I wished there was someone in my life who could solve all my problems or not solve all the problems. But to come along and say, Freddy, you take a couple weeks off and enjoy yourself and I'll do it for you. That's a big deal. No, that never happened. Freddy replied. Are you saying that all the people around you are indifferent? Mr. Edgar asked. Mr. Edgar, why do you like to ask such meticulous questions? Are people as they are, and is it unfair to divide them into good or bad? I mean, the same person can be different from one person to the next. Sometimes he can act like the ultimate scoundrel. Sometimes he can act like a wise man. Do you really think your stupid experiment is going to do anyone any good? I think you're just doing this nonsense because you've got nothing else to do. Freddy got mad. You mean Freddy? I don't really have anything else to do so I study people, and the results of my experiment will not go to waste. I'm writing my book, and in it I'm describing all sorts of silly things in your language. You know what's interesting? You were the most active last time, weren't you? Why are you criticizing my experiments now? Mr. Edgar asked. I don't know, maybe because it all annoys me. If your money bothers you, you could give it away for nothing. What do you care who or what anyone thinks of the man? Or are you just going to bluff Freddy? No, he's not bluffing. There are already several people who have gotten their one million out of my hands. There's been a lot of press about it. You can look it up. But it's too bad you're not participating this time. Too bad, said Mr. Edgar, and headed leisurely to his home. Over the next few days, Mr. Edgar went around to all the neighbors with the same question. 
Who do you think is a good person? It was as if the neighbors were all in agreement. They refused to discuss the subject. And when Mr. Edgar asked them if their reluctance to talk might be due to shame for having slum mud at many of their acquaintances last time, some of them threw him out of their homes. Minister Edgar was used to such displays, so he took no offense. But not everything was so hopeless. After he was kicked out of the church by the minister, he was caught up on his way home by that nice and sweet neighbor Iris. Mr. Edgar, if you're not in a hurry, listen to me. Is there someone I can tell you about? Said he as he ran after him. Well, that's interesting. Come on, let's go home, said Mr. Edgar. And they came to his well-maintained yard where there were wooden gazebos and Iris was the first to speak. I am aware that you have announced the second part of your experiment. Is that correct? Do you have someone to praise? Asked the old man. Yes, I have someone to praise. The best man in our village is called Eric. He is my husband's son. True, Eric is a bit spoiled, but he has a pure soul and pure thoughts. Choose him as the winner. You won't regret it, Iris said. I suppose so. And how can you justify such a flattering characterization of your stepson? Mr. Edgar asked. And then Iris wondered. All she remembered about her stepson was his dirty molestations, provocations, threats, and even his latest setup with a strange man. She doesn't remember anything else he did. But now we have to answer the old man's question somehow. You know, I don't really have anything to back that up. I just don't think Eric's personality is quite there yet. He's got his best stuff dormant inside of him. And if you give him a little push, everything will fall into place. My stepson will bring out his best, Iris said. Well, have I written down your feedback? Let us now wait until the end of the appointed time, replied Mr. Edgar lastly. After this conversation, Iris had a nice chat with the millionaire for some more time and then went back home. True, neither of them guessed that their conversation had been inadvertently overheard by someone in the immediate neighborhood. The news that the agitated son of the unloved Norman was claiming to be the best man quickly spread among the residents. Victor, the first to hear about it, was Freddy. He couldn't stand Norman's son. When he imagined that this pompous guy would be called the best, he lost his temper. He wanted to go to Norman's house right now and tell him what the others thought of him. But before that, he decided to catch Eric in something unflattering, so that everyone else would be convinced of the unfairness of Edgar's decision. He began to prepare his intrigues. Meanwhile, the teenagers, the youth of the village had also learned the news. The young lady's eyes lit up, and the young men nodded approvingly. As the youth sat on a bench along the road, Eric was just about to go to another evening of entertainment. Hey. Eric, you're awesome. Way to go, shouted one of them as he drove by. Eric didn't pay any attention to this remark, but just nodded his head in gratitude. A couple more days later, Eric was strolling down the main street of Istok. His path crossed with a local priest who was in a hurry to get to church. The priest remembered that this guy was a contender to be the best and decided to encourage him. Eric, you're doing great. Your father must be proud of you. You're such a nice guy, he said as he walked by. Eric nodded his head, but in the back of his mind he wondered a little what had happened to his neighbors. Usually, they didn't even say hello. And hear the compliments of admiration one after another. The cop who surprised him the most was the one who came running in from a distance and shook his hand. Eric, I always believed in you. You're a good man. We need people like you in our society. You'll see, soon the young people will start to follow your example. See if their morals improved, said the cop. Eric was definitely in a reverie now. It was as if the neighbors and the villagers were in cahoots. But he was quite pleased with this attitude. All day long he walked in high spirits. And the next day, as he walked down the street, without noticing it, he began to greet everyone first. And old Betty even invited him into her house and treated him to pies, which she only drank. When Iris called her friend, she was reading a sad novel and periodically sighed heavily. The misunderstanding in her relationship with Norman had taken a great toll on her. 
Of course, he didn't bring up the breakup again, but a cold wall had formed between them. Her friend had decided to support her today. Iris, but how are you still sad there, or everything is getting better? Asked her friend Catherine. It seems to have gotten better, but it's not the same. I think Norman is harboring doubts in his soul. I do not know how to influence it, so I am sad. To be honest, I'm tormented between two men, she sighed. What's the matter with Eric? He still oppresses you, and you can't tell his father anything so as not to ruin their relationship, Catherine asked. Speaking of Eric, things are about to change. Remember, I told you that we have a new neighbor, a weirdo, a millionaire. He promised one million dollars to whoever was chosen to be the best man in the village. I went to him and told him that Eric was the best man. Iris grinned. What do you mean he's the best man when he's a drunk and a bully? And anyway, what did he do to deserve such happiness as a free one million dollars? Catherine wondered. It's very simple. If he's lucky, Eric will get this money and the first thing he will do is to get away from his father. He will want to buy a house and live separately, and then he will want to organize his business separately from his father. The business is fine. He's not really into it anyway. He's agreeing to inherit it purely for the money, Iris said. Well, if that's the case, of course. Don't you have a chance of getting that one million yourself? Catherine asked. I don't think so. To get it, I'd have to have someone else give me that kind of feedback and no one here knows me. The ones who do know me quietly hate me. I don't know why. But I could certainly do something else if I wanted to," Iris said. The conversation went on for a long time, but the subject of money was never mentioned again. The last few days had been very meaningful for Eric. Active attention and recognition at every turn. It had changed his outlook on life and people dramatically. In just a few days he had noticed how many interesting and friendly people there were among these neighbors. He even began to feel shy deep down. That before he had always considered them petty people and disdained them. Now Eric could calmly linger on the street for a conversation with another neighbor. He could safely go to any of them in the house, sit at the same table. He liked that very much. Suddenly Eric felt that he also wanted to do something nice for these people. The first such person was an old lady-to-be. Eric specially set aside a free day to fix the old lady's old furniture. True, he had never done such a thing before. But the old lady herself helped him with hints. And when the business was over, she treated him to her delicious pie again. At parting, the old woman patted the boy on the shoulder and blessed him with good luck. Eric experienced such pleasant feelings for the first time in his life. A couple of days later, he wanted to feel this state again. He started looking for someone to help him with some things. A priest came to mind. When Eric arrived at the church, he was tidying up the yard. Eric asked him to sit on a bench while he hauled all the leather hay to the back of the church. When the job was done, the priest blessed him for good luck too. Then he invited the boys into the cellar, where they drank simple herbal tea. The priest told Eric different parables that made the guy think even more. Freud. Meanwhile, every day he asked Mr. Edgar about the results of the experiment. He was looking for a way to foil Iris's plans to keep Eric from becoming the best man in Freddy's village. One thousand times I regretted that I had written so many complaints about almost every one of my neighbors in the first phase, I should have left at least one alone. Now that one could have been listed as the best. If that one had won, one million from the old man, it would be split in half. Brady was doubly angry at his stupidity, and when he found out that the second candidate never showed up, with only a few days to go before the end of the experiment, he got into everything. Constant drinking. And today she decided to try once again to return the former warm attitude of her husband. She cooked his favorite dish, put on her best dresses, organized a romantic setting, and called her husband. Darling, so much has happened between us lately. I'm asking you to try to come home early tonight. I want us to have a romantic dinner, she said. I can't promise you anything as I have important things planned for today. I'll probably be late. Dryly, Norman replied. 
The conversation ended very quickly. Norman hung up the phone and thought. Since his wife was trying to win back his favor, she must have something to be ashamed of. The detectives, of course, found nothing suspicious in Iris's lifestyle, but still she was only to blame for allowing a situation in which he had to question her fidelity. Norman thought his deception about important business for the evening was correct, but in fact he had no important business to attend to. He had purposely decided not to have dinner together, so that Iris would be tormented as long as possible, and henceforth would not even think of breaking relations with him. Let this be a lesson to her for a long time, Norman thought. Meanwhile, the day of announcing the winners of Edgar's experiment was approaching. Everyone awaits this day with curiosity. Traditionally, on this day, Edgar would set a lavish table, serving the best wines and the most exquisite dishes. His neighbors didn't doubt it until they saw the sign on Edgar's gate and the sale of his house. Did our neighbor decide to move out? He didn't like it here. Where's he gonna move to? What's gonna happen to his experiment? Was it really a hoax? Were the neighbors whispering amongst themselves? Oh no, I've never cheated anyone in my life. It'll be just as I promised you, Mr. Edgar himself said. About that, indeed on the appointed day, everyone showed up except the Norman family. Eric was busy that day with his charity projects he had recently launched. Norman decided to intentionally stay late at work, and Iris waited faithfully for him. The guests feasted on gourmet food, drank good wine and marveled at Eric for not coming to such an important event for him. In the middle of the evening, Mr. Edgar asked for the audience's attention. You all know the occasion for which we are gathered here. I don't want to keep you waiting. I've already sold this house to a good man. He'll be moving in any day now. And I'm leaving your pleasant company, for my experiment has achieved its purpose. I know who is the best man among you," said Mr. Edgar and started walking around the table again. Eric, of course. Eric, this has long been known. But the lad is worthy. He's changed in a good way. Ever since the rumors started, the guests have been whispering about it. And that person is Mrs. Iris. It's a pity she didn't come. But I'll be sure to stop by before I leave and give her the money," Mr. Edgar said and asked one of his bodyguards to show him the suitcase with the money. There was indeed real money in it, neatly stacked in a row. The guests were in such deep surprise, as they knew nothing about this woman. And this woman did not know that she had been chosen as the winner of this contest. Two days later, early in the morning, Norman found a tiny note on the kitchen table from his wife, saying that she was leaving for Mr. Edgar and divorcing him.